Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Bates Botanical Boot Camp. We are talking about wildflower gardening today. And I am Caroline Gant. I work here at the nursery um, and all about. So wildflowers, I mean, this is one of my very favorite topics when, when it comes to gardening. I like houseplants, I like outdoor plants, but wildflowers really have a special place in my heart. You can notice my hair is kind of wild, which goes with theme um, of this of this webinar today. So if you think about wildflowers, these are plants that naturally occur um, in their environment. You see them growing on the side of the road. You see them growing in fields. They're not um, planted by anyone. And usually these are going to be straight species and native to the area. So we do want to consider that when we start planting our beds, depending on how you want to do it. So wildflowers, again, just it's a it's a wild, beautiful flower that's coming up naturally. Now we're gonna cultivate this a little bit and talk about turning this into beds. Now you can let it go wild if you do have the space or you can plant it, um, you can design it, you can think about texture, you can think about different colors. There's so many different options um, that you can go with to get started. But I'm just gonna take you on a little guide how I do mine and maybe what, what options you could go with and where you wanna go from there. So planning is gonna be pretty important when it comes down to this. Again, whether you want it to be a wild looking garden bed or a field or more contained. So I'm gonna go ahead and have um, my first photo come up on the screen. I have a lot of photos of my own beds today. Okay, so when I talk about being um, more on the wild side, this is gonna be one of my wildflower wild beds. So if you notice, I've got some plants that kind of clump together, but I really just scattered a lot of seeds, so it gives that wild effect. It has a pop of color, and to me, this is going to be better, um, a better host for our wildlife, and it's going to be way easier to take care of in the long run, especially after it's established. So this is my wildflower bed, and now let's go ahead and go to my second photo that we're going to show today. And this is going to be a more uh, more thought out, more planned out bed. But this is actually the first year of this sidewalk bed. So this next year, it's going to be more full. Um, those flowers are going to really fill out. And I used annuals and perennials in this one. Um, but it is more designed. I did layer stuff. I thought about height. I thought about color. You have two options here, whether you want to go with more of a wild look or more of a clean, um, planned out look. That's entirely up to you. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, what we're working with today, those are the first two photos I have for us. And don't worry, there are a lot more. Um, but let's talk about why you would want to do a wildflower bed as opposed to your more traditional um, landscaping that you see out in front of people's houses. For one, it's great for the environment. Um, it's going to create this biodiverse ecosystem that's going to host um, wildlife. It's going to host beneficial insects and just feed feed birds through the winter, which I love. There's a lot of winter interest that comes. So like I said, it's gonna be really, really good for the environment, but also it's gonna be so much easier for you to maintain this, especially after it's established, I would say year two to three. I don't have to do a lot to that first bed I showed you. I don't weed it, I just let it go. Again, we're talking about wild stuff. So if you don't have a lot of time on your hands, which I don't really have that much time on my hands. I work full time. I do a lot of stuff outside of work. Um, so to me, just having this wild, wildflower bed, which is the first show, photo I showed, is just, I mean, I get to look at it. I get to walk around. I get to enjoy it without walking out of my car, walking out of my house and being like, oh, I got to pull all these weeds. Because there are weeds in here, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but they're but they're hiding amongst those wildflowers. So you're not going to have to mow it. So if you turn part of your lawn or your entire lawn into a wildflower field, into a meadow, I mean, you're not going to have to get out there once a week with that mower using gas or if it's electric, using electricity, whatever it is. It's not honestly not that great. Nobody loves mowing. I mean, comment in the comment box if you do. But I can't imagine that anyone out here would rather mow a lawn then look at a bunch of wildflowers. But again, you're just going to be contributing to a, to a healthy biodiverse ecosystem, and it's going to be beauty really year-round. Um, I really enjoy my bed in the winter. 
It is fantastic. Um, I absolutely love it. So you'll want to think about your goals. I've talked about how this is really good for the environment. It's easy for you. So what is it you want to achieve with your wildflower bed, with your wildflower meadow, what it is, whatever it is that you um, are trying to do for yourself, whether it's actually just to support local wildlife, you're going to want to go with natives, um, straight species if you can. Is it to beautify your home? Is it to make a cut flower bed? Or like I mentioned before, is it just to keep from mowing? You know, it makes it so much better. Uh, Let's see. Okay. So one thing that I did want to talk about that I'm very lucky to have is I do have like a little bit of land. So more than just a city lot, I've got a couple acres. So if you are able to let part of your yard or part of your land just go wild. That is one really fun thing to do to let happen um, and see what comes up. So we're going to go ahead and throw up our next photo here. This is towards the back of my property. Um, We've just let it kind of go wild. And you can see we've got a lot of stuff that are coming up here. I've got goldenrod, ragweed, heliopsis, ironweed, jewelweed, so many things that are um, that are growing just naturally. And the amount of butterflies, insects, just little critters that reside here that come in and out. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to watch and to know like what I, what I am supporting here. Um, and it's, again, it's so much easier and it's really pretty. And it's so interesting to see what plants have been there, have been established all this time. Um, I probably had the property for about three years or so before I let this area go. So all of these plants were just, they were just resting underground waiting to come up. And a lot of these are native, which is good and which is why they were able to just stay there. They like the soil. That's where where they're used to. It's their home. So let's go ahead and go to the next photo. And it's going to be this field in the winter. And you'll get to see how nice it also looks in the winter. And you get to see my dogs, which is also really fun. Um, So it's still got grasses up. It's still got seed heads up that will feed the birds. um, And just, it looks really nice as opposed to just this field that's been mowed. The snow comes in and then it melts and it's just going to get muddy and a little bit nasty. Um, So like I said, I... I'm very lucky that I've got property to be able to do this and be able to see what comes up and what plants are living, what native plants I have. And one of my favorite things that I have found that has come up is jewelweed, which is a a flower. It's a wildflower that's really hard to to grow from seed. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it from just like a regular plant start. And you might not even know what it is, but um, I call it nature's cortisone. So you can use it to make like a a cream if you get poison ivy or anything, but it took a couple years of letting another area at my home go wild. Um, It was more of a shady area. And I started to notice these little cute, um, like reddish orange flowers. They almost look like tiny orchid blooms start to come up. And I walked down and I had my little um, wildflower identification book and I found it and I was thrilled that I have that growing because that one, it's really tricky to grow from seed. I've tried to transplant that. It didn't work, but I leave it up. I let it reseed itself year after year, which is again why I let um, those areas that I've let go wild stay up because I want those flowers that are starting to pop up. I want them to begin to reseed um, and just show, show all their beauty and really just take over everything. All right. So that's a little bit about me and my gardens. We're just, we're getting to our planning part. How do you want to do it? I would say a lot of folks probably don't have quite quite the land I do. I mean, it's not a ton, but if you do live in the city, if you've got a smaller lot, you can absolutely still make these things happen. And maybe you need a little bit of planning. So the first thing to consider to think about is to go ahead and choose that space where you want to start your flower bed, whether it's going to be a meadow or a bed. Now, pick it. It needs to have at least six plus hours of sun. Towards the end, I will go over some shade wildflowers. So if you don't have a lot of sun, there are some options that um, are there for you. But generally, most wildflowers are going to want a lot of sun to get those blooms up um, and happy and healthy and make strong plants. So go ahead and choose your area. I would say with this, with your wildflower bed or meadow, you're going to want to choose a fairly large space, not not huge, not like 
as big as you can go unless you are wanting to take over your lawn, which, I mean, if you want to do it, kudos to you. I say do it. I would love to eventually just have flowers everywhere. But choose that area. And I, the first time I did mine, I chose an area that was probably like five by eight and I could have gone bigger. And in the long run, I wished I had because these, these flowers get so happy, they establish and they start to really push out. Um, you might want a little bit more space than, than you're thinking about, especially if you're going for more of a meadow look. So you have two options, or I'm going to give you two options. I mean, there's more out there, but these are the two that I generally will use. So if you're starting your beds this year, now's the time to go ahead and begin that prep. So what you're going to want to do this time, if you're doing it now, is to remove that sod. So pick your area that you're that you're going to establish that bed in and go ahead and remove that, that top layer of grass as much as you can. I'll usually just get a shovel, put it under a little bit, and sometimes I can roll it back. It's, it's actually kind of fun to do. It's a lot of work, but it can be fun. So I'm trying to just remove that top layer of grass, but just the grass because you've got that top soil, which is really, really good soil just under that grass. So I'll usually pick up the grass, shake off that soil, and then compost um, all the grass that I brought up. Now, once that is up, if that's the way you've done it, you'll want to lightly till up that soil a little bit. Yeah. Now, your other option is solarizing or just um, choking out the grass that's already there. But this is going to take a little bit longer. Um, I actually tried to do this for a year to help really kill everything off. So solarizing, what I do is I take black plastic I'll lay it down on the area that I want to kill off that grass, that I want to have that new bed, put rocks on top so it doesn't blow up, um, and that's going to smother those weeds. I usually, I've read about it. It usually says like six to eight weeks is what you need to kill those off. So you could go ahead and do that and then start your bed in the summer. I would say wait until fall. Fall is a great time to start wildflower beds. It's a fantastic time to sow those seeds. So if you do have a little bit of patience and you would rather do um, smothering, that is a little bit easier. Um, and to me, it, it works out a little bit better because you keep that good soil that's on top because we're just killing off that that grass, that Bermuda grass, that crab grass that everybody hates that's so terrible. So once you have that that plastic laid out again at least eight weeks if not a full year i mean if you can leave it up for a year what's going to happen is those the grass is still going to be growing a little bit under that black plastic even though it's hot even though it's getting smothered i've seen it grow and i've even seen it go to seed so if it is able to go to seed it will reseed and its next generation will come up and that's the one i really want to kill so if you have the time to leave it down for a year and kill all those all those generations that whole family of grass do it if you can i mean it's a little unsightly you just put it Put a statuary on there or put some pots with some Japanese maple or something really nice on top. You can do it that way. But once you're ready to remove that plastic, go ahead and peel it back and you can till up that soil after that. So just like I talked about with removing the sod, when we're ready, slightly till up that soil, just working the soil a little bit. Get your hands in there. See what it's like. You know, make a worm friend or two. Do whatever you do, whatever you want to do. So. Once I till up my soil, I typically do not amend the soil, especially if it's a new bed. I don't feel the need to. Um, for me, my soil is pretty fertile. I, I live in an older home. It's not a new build. So this has been there for a long time. So I don't amend it, especially with going for more native flowers in there. They're already accustomed to the soil in your area. So there's really no need to do it. Now, you can amend it if you want to add compost. If it's really, really clay heavy, you can use something like pine fines to break it up. Or if you already have your own compost made, it's not going to hurt anything to just go ahead and mix that in. So that would be your next step to amend the soil, add compost, do whatever you need to do to bulk it up and make it a little bit more healthy. Um, but yeah, again, natives will establish in in that in that area that they're already accustomed to. So no need to waste money if you're if you're thinking you don't have to. Now, if you are in a newer build home, a lot of times they have brought in just like straight topsoil that's going to be really, really thick. And there's a lot of rocks in there. So if that's the case for you, you may need to remove some stuff and amend that soil. Um, we got a question. Yeah. And you can choose when to answer this. Absolute favorite native wildflowers. Mm. 
So I do have a list that I'm going to go over at the end. Um, I meant to email it to Tyler to put up, but we'll get it up after. Um, I love so many. Rutabecchia, I really love that one. That one um, has a special place in my heart. I've loved it since I was a kid. I have it in all of my beds, all of my wild wildflower beds. Joe Pieweed is great. Swamp Milkweed is great. I've got Cinderella. I've got photos that I will bring up um, towards the end of this webinar. And again, I'll also put this list up. Liatris is stunning. One of my favorites, and it also is a great cut flower as well. Um, and we'll, again, we'll shift back to that list and maybe I'll just send it over to Tyler to put in the comment box a little bit later, but great question about natives. Um, so let's talk about why, why you might want to go with more natives than just, you know, randomly picking out seeds that come in from wherever. For one, uh, that I talked about a little bit already is natives are native to that area. They, they're going to be used to that soil. They're going to be used to your humidity level, the sun, how warm it is, your seasons. They're already ready to go. And what's going to happen with that is they're going to be able to establish in these new beds that we have made where we've removed all this terrible grass, all this weed, all this weed, all these weeds that we don't really like. Um, and they're actually going to help choke out the weeds a little bit better than, say, something that's more native to to Asia or to not your even your specific region or state. You can get really specific how native you want to go, whether it's native to the U.S. or native to exactly where you are. Um, but I do find my natives establish, they take off, and they're way happier and they help compete those um, compete the weeds out and kill them off. And also natives are going to be a host for wildlife, for the wildlife you're trying to attract that is naturally in your area for beneficial insects. Natives are fantastic. Um, there are a lot of good resources, a lot of good books out there. And your local nursery, most of them will, I would say all at this point, will have a native section and people who can talk to you about natives. So if you come out here to Bates Nursery, we have natives. Um, I'm going to bring this, this guy up so you can see. This is one of our pots that says native plants. So you know for a fact that you are getting that. Um, we do, if you go to our website, scroll down to the bottom, we've got some tabs that will help you find it. Or if you're shopping, there is a native tabs on there as well. I, yeah, I love natives. I'm thinking about all the natives that I'm going to show you photos of, but that jewel weed, y'all, that one is a cool one. Really, really cool. So that's one option. You can go entirely with natives, but you can also mix in some non-natives if you want. Um, that again is all up to you. It's your design. It's your bed. It's your home. You can bring in natives. I will say be very, very mindful and careful of not bringing in very invasive things. Um, I have made the mistake years ago before I got really into more outside gardening and I, and I planted uh, one in particular non-native, very invasive plant. We do have a native one here in Tennessee, but this particular cultivar, um, this this type, this variety is not native to our area and has eaten one of my beds. So do your research on natives. Like I just mentioned, there's like yarrow, for instance, which I have in front of me. There are types of yarrow that are in fact native to Tennessee, native to our area, native to the U.S. And there's different other yarrow that's non-native to the U.S. that... Um, doesn't naturally grow here. So just because you read that one thing is native doesn't mean you can get just any of those. It's it's a it can be a little broad, but um natives are great. So like I said, if you want to mix in non-natives, up to you. I do like to sometimes mix in some annual non-natives or also annual seeds um to give like a little pop of color and help um you know, seasonally give different different growth heights, different different colors and different time of year blooms. But while we're on that topic of talking about um, seasonal looks, let's go ahead and bring up the next photo I have. And you're probably saying, Caroline, we're talking about wildflower beds. Why are you bringing up this photo of grass? Grass is a great option to add, especially if you're doing more of a meadow or like a scattered look. It's going to give you more texture and most grasses are going to bloom more towards the fall, like late summer, early fall. And it's great for uh, for the birds. I 
I absolutely love it. And again, it's going to help really choke out those weeds that we're trying to keep out of our flower beds. So like I said, this is in Tyler put up. This is Purple Arrow Little Blue Stem. It stays really, really short. This is a native grass. And then it shoots up these tall bloom spikes that go like three feet up. They get wispy. So while a lot of your other flowers, I mean, at this point, my rutabecchias bloomed out. I'll mix in zinnias there. They're starting to look a little bit sad. Echinacea, mine has usually started to brown and turn black. That's when my um, my grasses are starting to bloom. And this obviously is not a wildflower bed. There's a crepe myrtle back there. And I've got some um, St. John's wort in front. But I am going to establish a new bed this year and mix in some grasses because I just, I, I love the idea of doing that. So... You don't have to just stick with flowers. Grasses are a great option to add. You can also add, I mean, you can add shrubs. I've seen wildflower beds that have incorporate roses. A sweet shrub is one. Deciduous azaleas, if you've got the space to just give, put a couple in, maybe in the back or one in the center. I mean, that's going to look absolutely stunning. You will have to clean around it when the time comes to clean up that bed um, towards the end of winter, which we will get on in a little bit. So Tyler, let's go ahead and go to the next picture. I was talking about having shrubs in, um, in your flower beds. So this is one of my, my a little more contained, not really, beds. I've got, I've got catmint in here. Obviously, I've got a lot of echinacea. I also have evening primrose. It's more the tall one uh, that blooms yellow. You will see that on the side of the road here in Middle Tennessee uh, blooming in the summer. Be careful. That one will re re reseed and really take over. But I'm not talking about the low growing pink one. This is the uh, the upright yellow blooming. You can't see it in this photo because it's not blooming yet. But just behind all the echinacea, I've got a wild rose in the back um, that it gives some height. It gives a little bit of texture and the rose is going to bloom at a different time than this echinacea is blooming. And this one's really nice because I get rose hips out of this in the fall. Um, and it just, it, to me, it looks really cool year round, even in the winter when there's no leaves on it. It's got these gnarly stems that are just sticking up while my echinacea seed heads are still, still kind of blowing in the wind. There's no color, everything's brown, but still, still great to look at. Um, now that rose that is in the back, that's Rosa rugosa. It is not native. Um, that one started to take over a little bit. So you guys are probably starting to put together that all of my gardening beds or all of my my older gardening beds have been a learning curve. Um, I, you know, I've started researching more on plants that I'm choosing. I've worked at this nursery for four years now. So I have a lot more knowledge than I did um, when I bought my home and started planting stuff. So given if I could go back in time and <laughs> plant a different shrub back there, I probably would. Um, I still really like it. I don't hate it. And I do like the height difference it does um, lend to this specific garden bed. But again, I can't emphasize enough, do your research, plan out your stuff, and um, make sure you're getting the right fit for your area. So, you know, stuff doesn't get, get a little bit too wild. But you know what I would have done here, native azaleas in the back, the deciduous, those would have been would have been fantastic. Um, okay, so we can go ahead and take this photo down. But echinacea, that's also one of my, another one of my favorite natives. I, pro I don't really just have one. I have a lot because flowers are just the best. Um, so we've talked about choosing, choosing your flowers, what you want to plant there, what color you want to do. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about our design of it. So do you want to just do a scatter? So just have it be a random meadow look, literally making a meadow. So that this would be more of a seed um, seed way of going about things, just evenly scattering seeds everywhere so stuff starts to pop up randomly. Now, one thing I like to do is kind of clump planting randomly. Like I'll do a mass of like rutabecchia and on another side I'll do some yarrow and then yarrow over here, some shasta daisies around. So it's still... Um, it's still a little scattered, but there is some uniformity to it. So stuff is going to start to clump and be more grouped as they bloom instead of it just being um, like a 
like a tapestry mass of random flowers. Uh, or then you could really get down to it and design it and really plan it out. You can even draw your layout out, look at plant height, how big are they going to get? What time of year are they going to bloom exactly? If you if you really, really want to work with that, you can. Um, one thing that I like to do with my beds as I start to plan them are walkways. So whether it's a very designed, very controlled bed or a meadow, you're going to want to be able to walk around it or even walk into it if it is very, very large. So one thing I like to do is I use a um, weed barrier that I'll put down just on the perimeter. So for one, it will help get that or keep that grass from getting in, even though it's still going to go under crabgrass and Bermuda grass, will find its way in and it's not the end of the world. But this will help a little bit with it. And then I'll put, um, you can put mulch, pine straw down on top. So you've got this nice little walkway. And then I'll plant rocks, big rocks, flat rocks, kind of randomly in these beds. So if I do need to get in, I know there's a rock that I can step on. So I'm not going to step on all of my plants. And it, it makes a really nice look in the winter or in the spring when st stuff starts to come up and you can see where these rocks are. It also helps me remember what I planted in certain places. And then as everything grows up, it starts to disappear. This is the bed that I showed a picture of. It was the first photo we looked at in the webinar today. So this was, I would say, two, three years ago when I had first started this bed. So I had killed off this grass. I, I used solarizing for this one. I had kind of tilled it up. And then I got a lot of small uh, perennial starts, which you can find here at Bates or I'm sure at your local nursery. You don't have to go huge into these big gallon pots or half gallon pots. But these little four inch pots that we have, I was able to um, keep it pretty cheap and get a lot of plants that I could get in the ground that were already starting to grow. Because to be honest, you know, seeds are great. And I, I do a lot of seeds, but sometimes I just want, <laughs> I want to be able to see it and I want it to start growing and blooming um, a lot sooner. So if you want to go with plant starts, if you've already got your bed ready and you want to start with something that's already up and maybe even about to bloom or already blooming, this is a great option for you and, and still really, really budget friendly. So I just chose where I put stuff. I didn't even think about height because I wanted this bed to be really, really random. Again, as you saw from that photo. And so I clumped stuff together. I did keep like a lot of my Coreopsis together. Um, I got Liatris, which you can see down on one side. I've got Bee Balm, Jacob Klein that gets really, really tall and looks cool. All of that is in there. So I planted these. I watered them in thoroughly. And then I started sprinkling seeds around. So... I can see in the corner some seeds coming up. Can't remember what that is. Uh, but I did do California poppies. I did holy basil, which is one of my favorite things to grow. I'm pretty sure it is non-native, um, but it's a great medicinal plant. It Bees love it. It smells great. And mine reseeds itself. So one, one $2 seed packet will last almost a lifetime. Um, so I put seeds in this bed. And I also went ahead and did some seeds in here as well that are going to take like one to two years to establish. So I did do some um, some of those red poppies that they come up. I had some leaves come up. They didn't bloom the first year, but the next year they really did bloom. And I also put hollyhock in here as well. And that one to me sometimes takes like three years for it to really establish and start blooming. But again, this is the first year of this bed. I just used, um, you know, little plant starts and I did seeds to get to get, you know, to get it up and running. Uh, are there any type of wildflowers or grasses that you can layer over turf in areas where turf is spotty or isn't thriving instead of removing the turf? You can. Yeah, you can absolutely. We get that question here a lot about um, sowing wildflower seeds or just any kind of flower seeds just straight onto the turf when you can't remove it. There are types of flowers that will grow in it. It's just going to be a matter of them... Um, having to establish through that because um, the soil is not going to be quite as loosened and maybe not quite as fertile where it's getting down to. But that is an option. Uh, we've talked about zinnias will grow anywhere. Um, but another one would be Heliopsis or Helianthus. Heliopsis might do a little bit better, which is basically just like our native perennial sunflower. Um, that's something that I see growing up in uh, prairie fields out where I live. I see it growing in gravel driveways all the time. 
So that might be an option if you're not able to remove that sod or get it up. But if you're able to loosen it at all to get plants in the ground, that'd probably be best. And I would say I would I would suggest doing seed over plant starts if that is the case. What's going to be the hardest thing is making sure those seeds stay in place. And you'll probably want to plant a lot together. The germination rate is going to be a little bit higher for that. But that's a great question. Yeah, prairie sunflower, it's, it's fantastic. This is the other side of the bed, and this is a little bit later on in the season. So we've got the Rutabecchia maxima. This one is a great native. Uh, if you have not seen this before, it's a type of Rutabecchia, but that flower bloom, I would say, is like six foot tall. Tyler, do I, is that wrong? I don't it think gets so. five to six feet. Five to six feet on that so. tiny little stalk. I mean, I I remember being like blown away, but it's just like this one stalk that goes up, and you get this huge bloom, and you can see how gorgeous those leaves are down there. Um, and now you can also see how dense this bed is. So I recommend densely planting these wildflower beds to keep you from having to weed as much, because if you really pack it in there. Like we talked about with the grass growing in, and especially if they're natives, it's going to be hard for that grass to come in and compete with these flowers that are coming up. I mean, that Rutabecchia maxima, those leaves are so big and it's so like chonky and strong, like the root system of it. There's there's no grass that's going to outcompete that. So if you had a tight planting of that, I mean, yeah, you might have some weeds or what you would call weeds coming up in between. But that one is going to be one that is going to outcompete those um, all together. So just planting them really, really tight to keep those weeds out is something that you want to be mindful of. I was actually walking through this bed just the other day and through the winter, the the leaves that are just starting on that rutabecchia are already up. And it's gotten so much bigger since I planted it. So uh, that question that, that one of our viewers asked before about favorite native, I mean, that one that one actually might be my favorite native. I would say, yeah, rutabecchia, you could, you could mass plant that. I mean, eventually it's going to, some varieties will reseed themselves so much that you'll, it'll choke out any kind of stuff. So, you know, it it can compete with aggressive grasses. And also, I recommend mass planting that. I have some in a wildflower bed in my front yard, and every year it produces a new one. So right now, I think this year it's going to produce like a third one. So, you know, you could speed up time and get more of a look that you want. Yeah, you absolutely can. That was just one that I planted, and right next to it is some swamp milkweed. We got... We got a lot of stuff in that bed. But like Tyler mentioned, like I've already talked about, I mean, densely planting these things um, is what you want to go for. And now stuff might start choking another thing out, but that's that's nature, to be honest. And also, again, if you're if you're somebody who's really about not having weeds in your bed, but you don't have the time to weed, you know, densely mass planting is going to be the way to go. I talked about it earlier, but... Like I said, I don't have a lot of time to weed my beds. I mean, I the around my house I have more of a landscape design, you know, I've got some boxwoods, I've got some switchgrass, you know, some some classy things up there. But the amount of time I spend staring at the weeds while I walk by and saying like, "Oh, I've got to get here and, you know, get these up or, you know, I might finally have a day off and then I've got to spend it weeding." Um Still brings me joy, yes, because it's a it's a garden bed, but just looking down the hillside at my wildflower beds is just like, look at you. You're just going crazy, and I don't have to do anything, and I can walk down and cut flowers, and I see all these butterflies without doing a whole lot of work. I actually saw a yard. Um, it was on the internet somewhere, but I feel like it was in Nashville of a, of a woman who had just planted her entire front lawn with wildflowers. So there was no grass. She didn't have to maintain a lawn, flowers everywhere, and just gorgeous. Now, with that being said, obviously, it's not going to be gorgeous year round. You're going to have everything popping off with color, you know, for probably like a couple weeks at a time. Stuff's going to start dying back. So if you want to get out there and prune stuff and clean stuff, you can. Um, I just let mine go to seed. I let it start going to sleep, start looking sad. Again, when my grasses are starting to st throw seed heads and bloom. So there's still some fall interest happening. Um, but know that with these wildflower beds, wildflower meadows, it's 
not going to be a tidy look year round. I love the look of a messy of a messy garden bed year round, but if you're somebody who wants something really really tidy, keep that in mind. And here's another photo. So I just wanted to bring up some pictures of uh, some of my different beds. So this one I've got calendula right down in front. I've got zinnias. You can see right behind that's pot marigold. Right behind that pot marigold flower head um, is the holy basil I was talking about. So you see those purple blooms. Like I said, the bees absolutely love it. There's borage in the back, which not a native, but beautiful flower. And it's so tall. This one got insanely tall and then coreopsis behind that and that's something that's kind of cool too with this like tight mass planting and you can see I don't see I don't have on my glasses <laughs> but I don't see any weeds in here or any like any anything popping up and trying to like make its way out that I hadn't planted because it's so tight but like I was saying one really cool thing that will happen when you have this mass planting is plants that usually are a lot shorter, you'll see them start to reach for the sun and they'll get really, really tall. I had a marigold last year that I just planted from a start. I usually put them in my veggie beds that got like seven feet tall. It was crazy. You guys not might not believe me. I do have a photo of it, but it was because I planted it amongst my tomatoes. My tomatoes got so big. And then this marigold, one bloom stalk started coming up and then the tomatoes would shadow it and it just kept going. So just watching growth habit is also really, really cool. Um, cool to do with all these plants. So this is one of my native sunflowers that was actually gifted to me from Joy, who owns Sweet. Simple Joy Nursery. So if you are into natives that, um, you know, that is a very good resource right there. But this sunflower, it's the Maximilian. Uh, it is stunning. And it's so big. I think the plant itself was about 10 feet tall before it just started to lay down before because it got so heavy. And one thing I like about this particular one is it does bloom later in the season. So my blooms didn't start opening on this. I almost thought it wasn't going to open um, until like September, maybe the beginning of October. So again, while a lot of my other earlier season plants were bloomed out, this one was just starting to open. So within all of the, you know, kind of dead looking dry stuff, crunchy stuff, this one was flourishing and just you could see it in the bed. And it was so happy and stunning. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. We have a lot of different varieties um, here at the nursery as well of helianthus and heliopsis. And I've got I've got a couple different ones planted around. There's there's so many different kinds, short ones, tall ones. They're all fantastic. So this is the jewel weed I was talking about. And like I said, this one is I feel like it's not one that that you hear about very often or see, but it's, you know, it, it's not very showy. It doesn't have this huge flower and it's actually kind of hard to find. You really have to go searching for this one. But like I said, it was like finding the Holy Grail when I discovered this on my property. I was like so happy about it. But this is just a great example of a true wildflower that I that I have on my land that grows here. Um, and it's it's made for this area. And it's so, so happy to be growing. Uh, I'm really happy just looking at this picture. So if you hadn't seen that before, that is jewel weed. That's one of my go-to favorites. And that one actually is more of a shade loving wildflower. So like I said, if you don't have a lot of sun and you still want to do some wildflower beds, this is this is a good option for you. And it it is growable. I know I said it's hard to grow from seed, but um, that's actually how this one grows. It reseeds itself. Um, so it's doable. It's just, it can be a little bit tricky. And also for some reason, I've had a hard time finding finding them when I've tried to research you know, getting seeds or getting plant starts in from that one. That one's been a little bit tricky. But yeah, jewel weed. It's great. It's great. You should go hiking in the woods and try to find it. Look at that butterfly on that sunflower. So again, I'm just bringing in more pictures that really just show you if you scatter these. This is one of my areas that was all seed. So if you scatter seed, if you just kind of let it go, um, it's, it's going to clump, it's going to mass all together, and it's going to be really, really gorgeous. And one thing that also is going to happen is that these plants are going to support each other. So if you were to plant like a sunflower or one zinnia just by itself, what's going to happen is it's going to grow up, they get really, really tall, and as it starts to bloom, it's going to get heavy and start to droop over a little bit. So I find that if I clump these together um, and just scatter the seeds kind of tight, 
They will choke some out or you'll have to pull some out. But those plants are going to be a lot stronger and they're going to support each other. Like having a friend to lean on. That's pretty much what that garden bed is. Just just friends helping friends right there. And I don't know if you're like me, but I like seeing like stuff germinate. And so the more that you sow... And even if you try and establish some perennials and they don't get established, you still have that color. Yeah. You know? It's true. And one thing that's nice about um, like planting zinnias, planting sunflowers, more more annual flowers and you know, non-native, is that it's gonna take a while for these beds to fully establish. I touched on that a little bit earlier, but I'm in year three of my like wildflower meadow bed. I'm in year five of some of my um like more established flower beds, like that echinacea one that we showed a little bit earlier, but it took years for it to, to be full and really fully established. So especially if you're starting from seed, you know, this year, you're not going to see a lot. You're going to be like, okay, well, there were some flowers, like a couple flowers bloomed. It was a lot of leaves, but these plants are getting their roots in the ground. They're getting healthy. And by year three, that's the year you're really going to see um, a lot of stuff popping off and really, really taking over. So you do have to have patience with this. If you don't have a ton of patience, those plant starts that you can get, and you can even get larger ones, um, If you want to spend a little bit more money and really pack them tight. But, you know, patience is a virtue. Those poppies, the hollyhock seeds, a lot of other seeds need a couple years to actually really, really get established. So take your time. And I just had to put this picture up of this cone flower with the butterfly. Um, The amount of butterflies, moths that you're going to attract with these wildflower beds is going to be it's really, really cool to watch, especially if you have kids, they're going to love it. But, but it's also just so good for, for, the, for the earth and for the environment to really get these in the ground. Uh, echinacea is one of, my, one of my go-tos, like kind of my OG, that and rutabecchia that I have in a lot of my beds. I mean, they're no fuss. Like you don't have a lot of problems with them at all. And I leave the seed heads up through the winter to feed the birds. So they're really, really great. All right. So we've talked about winter a couple of times. Let's, let's move towards that about cleaning up our beds because I don't want to go, you know, over time too much. So winter time has happened. Like I talked about, I leave a lot of my plants, a lot of my seed heads up to feed the wildlife, but it also creates a habitat for a lot of, um, a lot of moths or things that are sleeping or even rabbits and stuff. They're going to dwell in this area. So leave it up. The, the earth is sleeping. These, these, Creatures are hibernating or, you know, doing whatever they need to emerge in the spring and be be their, be their beautiful selves again. So I leave it up. And then about a week ago, I started just going in and kind of shaking all the seeds that are left into the ground and then started removing a lot of the, the spent stalks, um, anything that didn't look great that I, you know, didn't want to have in the bed once new growth started to merge. I did start to remove that and then just moved it to my my compost area. Because once all this new growth starts to come up, I mean, you don't want a bunch of dead zinnia sticks in there, you know, just hanging out. I mean, you can you can absolutely leave it, but it would be more of an eyesore, but it also wouldn't give your plants as much space. So I do suggest eventually move, removing a lot of that uh, dead plant matter It'll be better for the plants. And when you think about it, once the rain starts coming in in the spring, humidity starts to ramp up, especially here in Tennessee. I think we're the <laughs> seems like we're the most humid place in the entire world. If you have a lot of dead plant matter, um, you might start to get some issues with those newer plants that are growing, some fungal issues, uh, and just have a little bit of rot in there. So towards towards the end of winter, very beginning of spring is when I do start to clean up my beds. Now, if if you're more of a tidy person and you just can't stand the thought of having having this up through the winter, you can remove it. Um, I suggest, you know, you can just mow it down, but mow it at a higher height. So move your blade up if you can. Uh, so you leave a little bit and when you mow it down, that will, you know, incorporate those seed heads into it a little bit more or shoot it out into your lawn and then, hey, You'll have more wildflowers coming up and maybe just another bed that's going to happen naturally, which I think is just fine. But just to wrap it all up, we're talking about wildflower gardening. Wildflowers are literally plants, flowers that come up in the wild without being placed, without being um, 
planned. You know, they just pop up. Most of them are native. Most of them are straight species. So if you wanted to get down to like the true meaning of that, that is how you could start your wildflower bed. But to me, it just kind of means going <laughs> going wild a little bit. I try to keep it to natives. Do your research. Make sure you're not getting anything that's a non-native, very invasive plant. Or if, you know, just make sure it's not going to take over this whole bed. Um, Any like, moisture-loving wildflowers you there recommend? Are some, yeah, there are some moisture-loving ones. Um, trying to think off the top of my head. A lot of them are, I feel like my columbine. I haven't, well, I never really talked about our shade-loving ones. Um I what fortuitous timing. Oh, look at Columbine. that. Swamp milkweed. I find mine likes wet feet. I've got it in like a lower part of my, one of my wildflower beds and it thrives down there. It's really cool. And it attracts these crazy looking aphids <laughs> um, in the summer that are, are wild and gross, but kind of cool. So this is our native Columbine right here. This one... Um, is more of a woodland plant. So if you have a lot of shade, this is one that you're you're going to really enjoy. And there's a lot of different types of columbine out there. I was actually having this conversation with one of our landscape specialists, Austin, the other day, because I love this one, the native one that we have. And he was like, no, Caroline, what about all these other ones that are gorgeous and purple and pink? I've tried to grow those. They don't do well. Uh, sometimes they'll just tank. They don't tend to come back year after year for me, or they will kind of sporadically. But this one has given me years and years of beauty. It gets bigger every year. The leaves actually stay up a little bit through the winter. And again, that's because it's native to our area. It's used to the soil. It's used to the humidity we have in the summer. It knows our winters. And it, I mean, this is a no fuss plant. I actually got this one from Terry, who works here and has done some webinars who's fantastic as well. I mean, everyone here is great, but she dug some up because hers had gotten so big and she brought this to me. And I mean, I barely had to do anything. I just dug a little hole, put it down and it just, it took off and it's so pretty. And the seed heads are even really pretty and they make kind of like little, little maracas. You can shake them and, you know, make some music. So yeah, Columbine right there. And we might have some more photos come to think of it. Oh, so I just talked about swamp milkweed. This is an up close photo of my Cinderella swamp milkweed. So look at those tiny, they are tiny flowers in this photo. It does not look tiny, but they look like little ladies or aliens wearing like a big cape or something. Um, it's such a pretty flower. It's a great host plant. So we didn't talk too much about plants that host certain things, but do your research about what these are going to host. This one, i I find to be really, really easy and it doesn't mind. For me, it doesn't mind having wet feet. It's in a lower part of my garden bed that has run off from my um, my neighbor's drain area. And it it actually, like, if we get a lot of rain, it it sits wet for days after the rain is gone. And this one, this one has done just fine. And this one, it's the plant itself is really, really big and it's got these like clusters of flowers on top. So that's a great one. Fantastic plant. Maybe we've got one. Oh, <laughs> all right. And so as you see now, we're just going through some of my favorite flowers that I have in my bed. So this is Sheffield's Pink Chrysanthemum. It is like a shrub. So if you're looking for something that's going to eat up space, and that question we got a little bit earlier about just planting in your lawn, in the sod without removing it, that's what I did with this. I, it was an area of my yard that there used to be a um, an in-ground pool like years and years before I bought my property. And so this area, they filled it in with like broken giant chunks of asphalt and just um, topsoil. And then it's got grass growing on the top that is, to me, almost impossible to remove. And I'm pretty good at digging stuff up. But... Anne, who works in our office, had recommended this, and I was like, I'll just give it a try, and I wanted to put it in this area, so I literally dug the saddest hole I could and just moved the grass out of the way, stuck this um, in the ground, and it took off. I mean, it established so quickly, like... I always tug my plants, which I don't recommend doing, but I like to see when they've the roots have really taken. This one took really quickly. Um, and then it's spreading out. So it's got little, little pups sprouting up everywhere. And it's actually taking over the grass, which I did not remove. I planted this. It was probably about, I would say, yay big when I planted it. And now it's 
a space like this large um, and there's not grass growing. So it is out competing that grass. But again, this is Sheffield's pink chrysanthemum. Really good one to have. Um, it blooms more towards the fall, especially if it's in shade. Mine bloomed like October. And then just another picture of one of my one of my wild wildflower beds. And this is one where I kind of grouped the seeds. This is the a seed bed I did, group the seeds around. So I group coreopsis, I group the pot marigold, I grouped the um, the holy basil, the zinnias, and the sunflowers. So there's texture. There's a lot of different colors. There's height. Um, yeah, and it, this one is one of my favorite cut beds that I have. I can just go down, cut those plants, and bring them in. So, and then here's here's that mm -hmm. echinacea photo with the cat mint and that Rosa Rugosa that I ordered online and planted without doing doing my research. So. You know, to reiterate one more time, do your research with creating new beds, even if it's just, you know, your traditional landscape in front of your house. Research every plant you're going to put in and do it for yourself. I mean, come out to your local garden center, talk to the people working there. And, you know, what we do here at Bates, which I love, we talk from experience. So a lot of us have been growing things um, Instead of reading tags, you know, we can tell you, like, I planted this at my house or I planted this at mama's house and this is what it did. I have worked with this flower. I know what it can do um, because, you know, plant tags from companies say something, but that company might be out of California and that plant's going to grow in California much differently than it does grow here. So if you are able to talk to people who have the experience with these plants, do it. I mean, you've got resources at at your local nurseries, whether you're here, whether you're in California. I mean, us plant nerds are everywhere and we, we love to talk about plants and experiment with them and tell you what we've done. Let me go down my list. Um, I did say I had a list of my favorite, favorite flowers. So my favorite shade wildflowers are gonna be Columbine, uh -huh. Woodland Phlox, mm -hmm. Astilbe, Jewelweed, Dicentra, and Hellebore, which, in my brain, hellebore isn't really a wildflower, but if you're going for flowers in the shade, hellebore is a fantastic option, and it makes for a good cut flower. Now, my favorite natives, which again, like we talked about, natives sometimes can be a little bit tricky because just that general, especially the common name, one type could be native to your area and the other one not. So still do your research. Um, we are in Tennessee here if you're watching on YouTube and in the U.S. if you're watching from another country. So Rutabecchia, I talked about that, that Rutabecchia Maxima. I absolutely love that. It comes up in prairies and cow fields. Joe Pieweed, Swamp Milkweed, California Poppies, Coreopsis, Echinacea, Heliopsis and Helianthus, those two native perennial sunflowers that I talked a lot about. Liatris. I didn't talk about that one too much. That one's also called Blazing Star. And I will tell you with this one, this one makes a great dried flower. So if you're able to cut it right when it blooms, when it's fully open, if you take that cutting and stick it in a vase, it will dry and it will hold its color. I have a vase of them right now and they, they almost look like a fresh cut flower. Uh, bee balm. The Jacob Klein bee balm that I talked about earlier is this red, super tall um, plant that, oh, it's so easy to grow. And that one will spread out too and start choking out grass as well. So if you're, like we talked about, if you're not really able to remove that sod, this is another plant that will start to really, really spread and help compete out that grass. Um, it's Monarda. And then butterfly weed, great for the monarchs. Everybody should be planting this. Tennessee has a great program. I don't know if it's still going on where they will send you seeds. Um, and I also see it in between the, uh, the interstate lanes, you know, the, the field between, I guess is what you would call it. Uh, goldenrod, which I have just coming up naturally in that, my wild field that I showed you. Baptisia. Uh, love that one. That one is fantastic. Uh, and then... Thermopsis carolinia, caroliniana uh, is something that I tried last year that we had at the nursery that is native. It's like a false lupine is what it's called. It's a yellow bloomer and it's really, really cool. Um, it looks a lot like Baptisia. Uh, allium, they're, the smaller ones are the ones that are native here. So there's a lot of different types of allium. There's big, tall ones, but from my research and what I have growing it kind of in my more native bed is going to be a very, very short little allium, but still has gorgeous blooms. 
they, it gets more blooms and they're just a little bit smaller. Um, Stokes aster, not a true aster, but this one stays up in the winter. Uh, and then yarrow. Not all yarrow is going to be native to this area. So research that. And then I can give you some of my non-natives if we want. But uh, Tyler's over there typing away and we are already going a little bit over time. So I don't want to keep everybody for too long. Uh, zinnias. I, I love those. Holy basil. Yeah. Forage, Sheffield's pink, chrysanthemum, that one's great. So those are some of my favorite little non-natives that I that I grow. Um, but thank you guys for joining this webinar. Again, wildflowers is kind of what you make of it. We talked about the true meaning of wildflower, but we're just thinking about wild beds instead of your typical um, conventional landscape flower beds or garden beds. We're going for more of a wild look. And one of the great things about it, other than it supporting wildlife, is that it's pretty much um, going to be self, self main, maintaining. You're not going to have to do a lot. Our goal is to not be out there and weeding. You're going to have to water it when you first plant those things in. But my established beds, especially the ones that have been there three plus years, I don't water them anymore. I mean, if we get a drought, they'll start to look sad. I might lose some stuff. You can water them, but I literally do nothing other than every every couple of years I'll scatter some more seeds um, and then cut it back when the time when the time comes for me personally to remove everything. So try yourself a wildflower bed, a wildflower meadow. Um, do your research, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, letting me talk about one of my absolute favorite things to discuss. <laughs> <laughs>